Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to IEEE, another session of IEEE webinar brought to you by IEEE PES Malaysia chapter. Before we begin our program this evening, let's together we have a moment of silence for prayer. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, today, uh, we gathered for another webinar session with the title of Sustainability in Oil and Gas and Petrochemical Industry. Before we begin, um, let us understand what the past day is all about. For your information, Power Engineering, Power and Energy Society, the goal is to engage all the past volunteers and practitioners with past history and on five past pillars for the more power to the future vision. So the first vision is advancing global participation. Second, educating the future workforce. Third, industry activity trends. Ensure standards leadership and participate in regulatory initiatives. As we know now, globally, many countries are still predominantly dependent on coal and oil for electricity, transport and goods. Therefore, it's up to us that we need to take an action now to change this, as we all need to create awareness among engineering community and public towards changing to a more clean and renewable source of energy. For your information, this year is the third IEEE PES Day celebration, where we celebrate the unity, strength and achievement of IEEE, PES Society, and all engineers around the world. Let us all together, we work to bring more power to the future with affordable and clean energy. Today, we have uh, another distinguished speaker coming from industry, Mr. Eric. I will go through with his introductions later. But before we proceed, um, let us uh, introduce you a little bit more about IEEE, PES Energy, PES Society. For that, I would like to invite Dr. Harun Arashid, IEEE PES Malaysia Executive Committee, to present the details about IEEE PES. Over to you, Dr. Thank you very much, Aya. Let me Am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay, let me share. Sir. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see. Yeah, uh, the voice is bouncing back. I, some, I, can, uh, I cannot mute. I think you need to mute some. Otherwise, I won't be able to. OK. All right. Uh, thank you very much once again, uh, Aya Noor Muhammad Fadli, for organizing this webinar. Uh, uh, my name is Arun Naseeb, and I'm from IEEE Power and Energy Society. I'm the Malaysia Society, as well as I'm the students and young professionals here for IEEE Power and Energy Society in Malaysia. Uh, before I begin, uh, Aya Noor, can you? Um... I think you need to turn off your microphone as well. The voice is bouncing from your side, I believe. OK, now it seems clear. Yes. OK, let's begin. All right, so once again, uh, welcome to IEEE Power and Energy Society webinar. Uh, uh, today, this is uh, 16th webinar in the same series. And thanks for, to Aya Noor Mohammad Fazli for uh, inviting the speaker as well as me to present uh, a little bit about IEEE Power and Energy Society. So I, would, I will just not take long time, maximum 5 to 10 minutes. 
just to give you an overview of what IEEE is and uh, what we do in IEEE. So moving forward, IEEE is world's largest professional association and the tagline of IEEE is advancing technology for humanities. Uh, we have around 422,000 plus members all around the world and they are covering more than 160 countries. We have about 123,000 student members. And what we do in IEEE is we organize the conferences. Every year we organize uh, webinars, seminars like this due to COVID-19. Now we turn to webinars. Usually we organize seminars, uh, technical events. Then we organize uh, uh, conferences. So conference is one of the main thing that IEEE is very well known to many people. So we have like about 2000 annual conferences around the globe. If we talk about technical bit, we uh, also IEEE have something called IEEE Explore. Those of you who have been publishing papers with IEEE or similar other uh, publishers, you might know about IEEE Explore. So IEEE Explore basically publishes all your papers and it's a Scopus Index uh, citation uh, publisher. Uh, we have like 200 plus top cited periodicals and then there are about 49 technical societies, uh, technical communities and councils all together under IEEE. And socially, uh, there are IEEE has some, some groups which are focusing on humanitarian efforts where uh, they are looking forward to specific projects which cater uh, any type of help that they can do to to the uh, to the humanity by going into the humanitarian projects. Then there are some certification programs for those who are uh, engineers. They need to gain their IR status or professional engineer status. So for that, they need to take some CPDs or continuous professional development hours. So for that, IEEE helps out as well. Uh, by arranging those courses which are needed for them to complete their uh, annual CPDs. Okay, as I mentioned that uh, IEEE has um, uh, many societies, so there are all together about 39 technical societies under IEEE and um, uh, IEEE Power and Energy Society is one out of them. Uh, you may have heard of IEEE standards as well. Uh, uh, under IEEE standards, the very well, very famous is the one we use for Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi standard is basically from uh, IEEE standards. And if we talk about Power Energy Society is the second largest technical society under IEEE. So our basically main goals under uh, Power Energy Society or in short PES or PES, uh, we basically focus on growing and maintaining your technical expertise, getting connected you to other professionals by organizing some webinars, events where you do your networking and contribute to the future of power and energy. And if you are a member of IEEE as well as member of IEEE Power and Energy Society, you save money on joining the programs or conferences. Okay, technically, as I earlier mentioned, under Power Energy Society, uh, technically you can find some uh, resources which are like online webinars and tutorials which are available at uh, Power Energy Society website. Then on-site training and workshop, I already mentioned. Then we have a technical journals of Power and Energy and we organize the courses for industry. So basically our purpose is to focus on practicing engineers member to elevate them and to keep them updated with the uh, with the technical community technical society so that they remain active with their CPDs or PTH. Okay, IEEE also has a, a PES resource center. Uh, you can just Google it or I will uh, later on share the web link as well. Uh, IEEE Pest Resource Center uh, has uh, a lot of uh, tutorial videos. Uh, you can find technical reports of the previous conferences, journal articles published under Power Energy Society. And then there are uh, conference slides of uh, previous conferences held all around the globe. So these are all resources which are available free to all IEEE uh, Power Energy Society members. In terms of global engagement, uh, uh, IEEE is covered all around the world and it's uh, divided into regions. 
uh, from region one to seven is in uh, United States. Um, and then uh, region nine, uh, sorry, one to seven is in United States and Canada. Uh, region nine is uh, uh, Latin America. Region eight covers Africa and whole Russia or, and Europe. Uh, we are in region 10 uh, and region 10 is one of the largest region in terms of uh, overall IEEE uh, members. And in terms of power, uh, power energy society members, of course, they are in, uh, if we collect region one to seven, they are more, but individually region wise, region 10 is the most strongest in the region, in the, in the whole world under IEEE. Uh, here are some of the pictures of uh, IEEE PES leadership. These are the PES uh, chairs starting from 1994 since our existence in Malaysia till 2020. And our current chair 2020 is from University of Malaya, Professor uh, uh, Hasli bin Mokhlis. So these are uh, their photographs of all our past chairs and current chair. Okay, what we do uh, in detail under PES is we do the invited lectures like today's lecture. Uh, then we organize conferences within Malaysia as well and overseas. And every year we have an outstanding engineer award. Uh, so uh, if you are a PES member and you qualify for that, you can definitely apply for it or your friends can nominate you. Uh, then we, we make the bridge from academia to industry. So it's like a linking between industry and academia, uh, which we, we are uh, trying to, to help reaching the industry with the academia or academia with the uh, industry vice versa. Then we organize technical activities, final year project competitions every year in uh, almost several universities. We sponsor the final year projects. And uh, also, uh, we organize another thing called senior member tribes. So basically, under IEEE, there are a few levels. If you are a student, you can join as a, a student member. Or if you are a postgraduate student, you can join as a graduate student member. After these members, uh, after these two categories, if you are already graduated, you are no longer a student, you can join IEEE as a member. But there is something that IEEE recognizes is a senior member. Senior member are those people who have certain period of experience after their first degree. And if they qualify for that, they can, they can elevate themselves to senior member level by, uh, by some procedure. So we basically organize those uh, senior member drives as well. And uh, for this detail, you can later contact me if you are IEEE member and not yet senior member and you would like to elevate to senior member level, you can contact me personally later on. Uh, okay, so uh, if you are a student member and the, uh, the graduate student member, the fee is just $27 for one year. But now if you join, you will pay only half of it and you will get the full benefits until the end of this year. So, which is like 13 US dollars. And if you are a, a member, you are a professional graduate, so you would like to join as a member, uh, you can also join with a half fee. The full fee is 85 US dollars, but as a half fee, you can just pay 43 US dollars and then you can become IEEE member to receive the benefits till the end of this year. Okay, as I earlier mentioned that uh, we are in between linking Power Energy Society. If you become IEEE member, uh, first thing, you get all the IEEE benefits, but to receive the benefits of uh, Power Energy Society, you have to become PES member as well. So in order to get PES membership, uh, you have to pay additional uh, charges, which are not much. Uh, uh, I, I have to double check how much is the price for the half year, uh, but probably it's not more than 15 US dollar. Okay, and if you are a student and you would like to join IEEE or never join uh, Power Energy Society in the past, you can join PES for free for first year. So more information for this, you can also contact me. Uh, these are the contact details. You can reach to IEEE Power Energy Society Malaysia, our email address and the web address and Facebook. You can uh, find more information about us over there. My email address I will share in the chat box after this presentation, then you can directly contact me. And here is our current XCOM of 2020, uh, including our chair, past chair and council uh, and the current executive committee. With this, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, uh, uh, I will prefer that you write in the chat box uh, after this, uh, because we have a very honorable talk after this. 
So, or you can just directly reach me by email. Thank you very much. Over to you, Ayar Noor. Thank you so much, Dr. Harun, for an insightful sharing about IEEE, Power Engine G Society, and the rest. Okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, before we proceed with our main webinar speaker, uh, let's together turn on your webcam or laptop camera for us to capture a moment, uh, to capture all our participation in today's webinar session. Let's take some time, uh, it takes about uh, one minute or so to, uh, to activate your webcam for a group photo session. Okay. All right. Let's give another 10 seconds for people to activate their webcam. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, give a smile to the webcam and we're going to capture the picture. One, two, three. Okay. Let's take another picture. One, two, three. Okay, thank you so much. Um, all right, now we're going to proceed with our main uh, presentation this evening. Um, let me give some brief introductions about our speaker. Uh, our speaker this evening will be Mr. Eric Koenig. He's the Director of Oil and Gas Strategy and Marketing Segment for Schneider Electric, based in France. He holds Master of Business Administration and Masters of Science degrees in Automation and Business Administration from the National Polytechnic Institute of Lorraine University in Nantes, France. He possesses a vast experience in the industry with broad industrial automation and energy efficiency system experience. He has also been involved in Schneider Electric business acquisition activities over the last 15 years. So today, he, we are glad to have Mr. Eric to share with us on a presentation with the topic of sustainability in oil and gas and petrochemical industry. Without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Eric. Over to you, Mr. Eric. Mr. Eric? Uh, okay. Mr. Eric, we can't hear you. May, perhaps you can unmute your microphone. You can start presenting now because you are not presenter. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can, can hear you, you now. Hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, very good. All right, that's uh, great. I will try to share the content on my screen. I hope it will uh, it will work. Otherwise, I will ask you to uh, to share. Yeah, it's loading can now. You, can you guys uh, see my screen? Um, yes, we can see your screen. You can see your screen and right. you are audible. So thank you very much for the... Okay, very good. So thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, good afternoon to you. It's still the morning for, uh, for me, but it's my pleasure to, uh, to join you. Uh, at the request of my uh, colleagues in uh, in Asia Pac and uh, Malaysia. So as said, my name is Eric Koenig. I'm in charge of uh, strategy and marketing for the oil and gas and petrochemical segment in uh, Schneider Electric. Uh, let me check if you see the second screen. Is it still okay? Yes, it's still okay. All right. So what we see and what we understand from our customers is that we have four major trends in our industry. The first trend, and this trend is especially important in these times of uh, 
challenging oil prices is to improve the return on investment of our oil and gas and petrochemicals projects. So return on investment means optimizing the capex, the time to first oil or to first gasoline if you are building a refinery, the OPEX costs, the uptime and the yield. So improving the return on investment is a major issue. A second major issue in our industry is the digital transformation. Another one is the evolution of the workforce uh, with a big pool shift uh, where many of the experts are uh, of a certain age and will retire sooner or later. But I will retire sooner or later. But another major issue is sustainability and energy transition. Probably we have seen that in uh, Europe uh, um, maybe a bit earlier than in other uh, regions. And probably Asia and uh, Southeast Asia is the next uh, region to address these uh, topics. And uh, probably the US will be uh, among the last to uh, really take on this topic in the oil and gas industry. So uh, they are not always leading all the, all the subjects and we see them maybe a little bit late, later than the other regions like Europe and Southeast Asia. And of course, these four mega trends are somewhat interconnected. You cannot improve the return on investment if you do not have any financial support, if you do not have the social license to operate. The digital transformation is a key enabler to sustainability and energy transition. If you want to hire um, the younger generation who are more environment conscious, you need to explain them that your company is working on sustainability is addressing the energy transition and so on. So really four interconnected subjects. On, in terms of sustainability, sustainability, you probably are aware of the 17 United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. And usually in the oil and gas industry, some of these SDGs, some of these United Nations Sustainability Development Goals are more important than others or represent bigger challenges. Here I take an extract of the Shell Sustainability Report. So it's something that's easy to, to find. And uh, Shell highlights especially the Sustainability Development Goals number seven, eight and 13. Of course, they also address all the other SDGs, but they they, they claim the, their main challenges or their main um, response are on affordable and clean energy, making sure that the oil, that the natural gas that they produce are produced as cleanly as possible. They want to make sure they address make sure they the climate uh, action. And of course, they want to make sure that they provide decent work and economic growth in the various countries where they operate. So I don't claim that uh, the, oil and gas, uh, the oil and gas industry should only target these three SDGs. But what I say is that usually climate action and clean energy aspects are the most important or the biggest challenges uh, on, uh, on these subjects. Uh, so most of the rest of my presentation will address the greenhouse gas emissions, or if you prefer, the carbon emissions, because that's a major challenge for our industries. So we, as Schneider, we believe that uh, we can support the oil and gas industry in this subject, because ourselves, we are a recognized sustainability champion. So I don't want to spend too much time advertising Schneider Electric achievements and, um, and uh, Schneider Electric position in sustainability. But I suggest if you have some time to explore uh, under this link, to explore the Schneider Electric Sustainability Extranet. 
as an example of a company with a very high rankings and recognition on, uh, on the subject. So I will continue more with, uh, with, what we, with what we do and how we can support oil and gas companies in achieving their greenhouse gas emission reductions uh, targets. So greenhouse gas emissions usually are measured on scope one, scope two, scope three. Scope one is your direct emissions when you operate, uh, when you use uh, energy and you emit carbon, uh, CO2 or even directly methane in your oil and gas production, refinery, uh, liquefaction and other operations. Then the scope two are the emissions from the purchased electricity, heat and steam. If you purchase electricity from the local electric utility, of course, you should also incorporate the carbon impact of the energy of the electricity production. If your local utility produces electricity from coal, that means it has a significant carbon impact. If your local electric utility produces electricity from hydropower or wind or solar, the carbon impact is, uh, is about zero from this electricity you purchase. Then you need also to integrate the scope three at suppliers. If you use, uh, if you buy pipelines, a steel structure, uh, switch gear, automation equipment, if you hire consultants uh, or uh, engineers from various suppliers, you need to integrate the scope three emissions from all these purchases. And then in the oil and gas industry, of course, you will have also to integrate the scope three at customers. If you sell gasoline or diesel to your end customers, uh, usually these end customers will burn this gasoline or this diesel into their engines, into their motors. So you need to integrate these, and of course, this will be a big impact on your total greenhouse gas emission on your scope three at customers. So usually, most of the oil and gas companies have now defined very ambitious targets uh, on greenhouse gas emissions, usually in scope one and two, and very often on scope three at suppliers and also at customers. So how to reduce these greenhouse gas emissions? So what, what, what I propose or what I present is our proposal, our approach as Schneider to support uh, customers uh, and to support oil and gas companies. But of course, whether you do it with us or with, uh, without us, you will in practice have to follow a similar approach. So the first element is to identify what you want to do. You need to define what will represent a success for you. What are your targets? You will define uh, you will need to define what is a success and what are the targets. Then you will have to deploy your program and sustain the results. Whether you do it with Schneider or with someone else, I, I don't care, but you will, in practice, need to define your targets, define your program, and make sure that you can sustain these results. You will have to apply various solutions. You will have to apply various uh, software, application, hardware, systems to ensure quantified results. And you probably will have to articulate energy efficiency, electrification, and decarbonization measures. So for your scope one and two, you may want to apply an optimized design. You may want to optimize, you may, to, uh, you may need solutions to optimize power and process control, you may need to deploy leak detection, and you may need to deploy instrumentation, you may need to uh, deploy heat exchange, flue gas recovery uh, measures, you may even want to start with building and retail controls, 
you may to want to electrify some of your processes you may to want to make sure that electricity that you buy comes from renewables and uh, you may need to use microgrids you may to want to have sourcing with power purchase agreements energy as a service agreements if you consider the scope three at your suppliers you may want to assess your supplier co2 impact and we can provide the co2 impact of all the products and systems that we supply to you and you may inspire from this methodology for your other suppliers then you may want to develop your renewable power generation and sell electricity coming from renewables you may want to develop EV charging infrastructure. You may want to develop into biofuels, into plastic recycling, into hydrogen, into carbon capture and storage. And again, we can help you on that. And of course, you will need to measure, uh, to measure this and to have some kind of CO2 reporting uh, dashboard. And we can help you on, uh, on this again. So, I sometimes advertise what we do, but whether you do it with us or, or, or not, these are more or less the steps that you will need to, uh, to take. Uh, so I mentioned three major uh, approaches, energy efficiency, electrification and decarbonization. So these are three complementary approaches mainly on scope one and two, which is mainly on scope one and two. So energy efficiency is making sure that your system, that your operations use energy the more, the most efficiently possible, that you have process optimization in the design over the life cycle, that you optimize your process, your operations and so on. Then electrification also contributes to uh, carbon uh, optimization because usually it's better to replace mechanical drives with electric motors and variable speed drives in a number of uh, operations, in a number of uh, processes. If you have electric fracking, it's easier to control than uh, uh, fracking with uh, mechanical drives. If you have your gas compressors, water injection pumps that are managed with electric motors and with variable speed drives, it's easier to control and to optimize than with mechanical drives. And same thing, sooner or later, uh, you will need to check if electric heating of larger furnaces is relevant because these things are usually easier to control than with uh, gas burners and uh, mechanical drives. And then decarbonization, once you have electrified your processes, you want to make sure that this electricity comes from renewables, which you usually have zero carbon impact. So three complementary approaches. Uh, one is not enough. You really need to deploy the three of them. Then, uh, you may have different needs uh, as, as an individual customer. You may want to manage your greenhouse gas emissions in your current operations, in your current refinery, in your current oil or gas production. You may, maybe you are working on a future plant. Maybe you are designing a new uh, uh, offshore platform, maybe you are designing a new petrochemical plant and you want to optimize the greenhouse gas emissions in this future plant. Maybe, maybe you want to address carbon emissions in your current office buildings, in your current data centers, in your current petrol stations. Uh, so maybe you want to address carbon emissions in your current office buildings, in your current data centers. In you probably have hundreds of thou or thousands of petrol stations and each of these petrol stations is a small retail uh, shop 
and uh, uh, each of them uses energy and same thing your office buildings use a lot of energy and it's an easy target uh, for optimizing carbon emissions and maybe you want to develop clean energy and not only sell molecules of uh, methane of uh, molecules of octane etc like you do today but you want like shell to go from molecules to electrons and start selling renewable energies so depending on what is your target you may use different solutions and uh, here i will continue with some of the solutions where we schneider can support you but of course you may source these solutions from other suppliers just take them as examples and there may be some other solutions to support you in these different uh, approaches so don't take them as an exhaustive and a unique list and we are probably not the only suppliers for each of these but you are welcome to uh, to, to come to us for uh, for these solutions so i will present probably 13 solutions maybe i will skip some of them mr irnour please feel free to stop me uh, when I've uh, passed uh, my, uh, my, uh, my time. Uh, we don't need to go through all of them. It's just a matter of presenting some of these solutions. So if I continue, uh, one solution, uh, and often it's easy to, to forget, one solution that you should not forget is that safety should not forget that safety is part of sustainability safety avoids uh, a number of safety solutions avoid major leaks major accidents uh, they avoid unwanted flaring operations etc so you you all have in mind some of the catastrophes in the recent past the bp macondo oil spill it, it was not in 2020 i think it's 2010 my apologies the BP Macondo in the Gulf of Mexico killed uh, 11 workers, injured 17 workers, and that was a start of the one of the worst environmental disasters in U.S. history. Uh, this uh, catastrophe contaminated 1,100 miles of coastline, so a major catastrophe. It cost bp billions of dollars in um, in terms of uh, money but it was a major sustainability challenge for uh, for the region so don't forget uh, that safety is sustainability avoiding accidents leaks and flares uh, it starts very often with a triple safe triple redundant safety system triconnex is one of them so the emergency uh, shutdown uh, makes sure that your plant stops uh, in a safe mode in case of a major accident. But you, of course, have other process safety solutions like operator training systems, safety advisor, control system modernization, cybersecurity. All of these contribute to the safety and eventually to the sustainability of your plant. Also, don't forget the electrical safety solutions uh, with all the switch gear, asset advisors, augmented operator advisors, etc. So, one message: safety is a major part of sustainability, avoiding, helping you avoid accidents, leaks, and flares. Then, another important step uh, for ensuring sustainability are microgrids. So microgrids, uh, my, uh, microgrids is what? Microgrid is a system where you combine renewable power generation, maybe other power generation means, uh, plus battery storage, and uh, control and management of demand and supply. So both demand and supply need to be managed uh, you may want to have some load shedding optimization. You may want to switch off less priority um, applications, but you have to balance all of that 
very often with some artificial intelligence solutions that will select the cheapest and greenest available energy at a given time. And of course, that needs a optimized system, of course, that needs a optimized system design. And in some cases, you may even want to call on financing and use your microgrid in an energy as a service approach where somebody else, a third party, a bank, will provide the upfront investment and you uh, pay for your energy as you go, as you use it. So that is another element that you want to consider in your sustainability approach. Probably a third one, especially in your uh, areas where you have regular areas, where you have winds, is to deploy wind farms. So a wind farm, of course, starts with a wind turbine, but the wind turbine is not the only element in a wind farm. You have additional uh, controls and switch gears that need to be integrated with this uh, wind turbine. And then the wind turbine needs to be connected to it. And then the wind turbine needs to be connected to each other and needs to be connected to the grid. And you need to supervise all of these because, of course, the wind is uh, sometimes um, uh, intermittent. It's not always regular. You need to adjust uh, the production to the needs or vice versa. So wind farm may be an option for, uh, for you. Of course, a solar farm may be another option. I will skip. Uh, I will skip that. Then you, again, a totally different approach. You may want to report uh, on sustainability, and we have tools like resource advisors that can help you, and can help your reporting on uh, environmental impact. And you can track your carbon impact, your water footprint, your waste footprint across your operation on one site or on multiple sites. So that's another example of a tool that can, that can help you reporting on uh, sustainability. Then another tool that you may want to explore is what we call energy sustainability services. A company like Schneider, but you probably can find other suppliers, can help you purchase energy from, uh, from various utilities, from various suppliers. They can help you purchase electricity and other energy and optimize this sourcing by buying smarter, by defining exactly your need, and by also integrating the carbon impact of these purchases. So don't hesitate to go for professionals, for professional uh, service operators to help you buy in a smarter way this energy and reduce your energy costs and your pro, uh, purchase costs on energy. You may want to explore this uh, extra net of uh, Schneider Energy Sustainability Services. But uh, of course, this is advertising our company. But um, you may want to, to follow such a route of hiring a professional support to buy energy from uh, third parties. Then we have gone, then we have gone as an example again, we have gone into a partnership again. We have gone into a partnership with a company called Carlyle, the Carlyle Group, which is a major company with 220 billion uh, portfolio of uh, investment. This company typically will invest into a power generation plant if you need power generation. So they will invest in the power generation plant for you, and then they will supply the electricity to you for, uh, of course, for a yearly fee or a monthly fee or a fee per megawatt hour. But they will take the upfront investment of the infrastructure and sell you the service. And this joint venture that we have built with them uh, will optimize with microgrid and control solutions, will optimize uh, the uh, initial investment and will optimize 
help you optimize uh, your consumption to make sure that uh, the infrastructure that is built is right sized and not uh, oversized. Then another solution that we suggest is to have a closer look at the systems that you have in your plant, in your refinery, in your petrochemical plant. You probably have a process automation system and you probably have a power control systems. And most likely, historically, these different systems were designed, managed and operated in totally independent ways. And what we suggest is to have a closer look at the interaction of these two systems. Very often, uh, by better connecting these systems from the design stage, in the operation stage, in the various optimization uh, stages, by enabling uh, functionalities like load shedding, generator overload management functions, you can really optimize the energy usage and sometimes reach up to 10% process energy usage improvement. So again, you need a more holistic approach to your process automation and power control systems uh, uh, and see how you can better integrate these to ensure some energy savings in your plants. Another approach that Another approach that we recommend, especially in the design stage of your plant, is to optimize uh, your complete design. Very often, the EPCs and the people designing uh, your electrical uh, distribution and your complete power system, very often they have a natural tendency to reapply the good old designs of the past. The problem is that these designs were often too redundant, too, uh, too expensive. Uh, you would use a cannon to kill a fly. And if you have a closer look at this and uh, consider strategies to provide really fit for purpose solutions, let me take a simple example. You want a simple example. You want to consider starting your electric motors one after the others. Okay, it takes you a few more minutes, but if you start them one after the others, you can really optimize the power generation and the power distribution system. Of course, if you really need to start all your electric motors at the same time, okay, but maybe you want, you are ready to start them one after the other, because anyways, you will do that only once a year or uh, once in a, in a lifetime. So it can generate lots of savings in terms of money, in terms of footprint on your offshore platform, and it can generate savings in terms of carbon impact. And we have a number of examples of that where we have generated savings in terms of capex, in terms of CO2 savings, but also savings uh, avoided during the life cycle, uh, thanks to the better control from the control system, thanks to deploying various variable speed drives, thanks to uh, optimizing the electrical distribution system, so we can help you assess the CO2 impact of your complete system. And we have published a white paper and a methodology on that that uh, are accessible on our uh, website, Extranet. Then, of course, remember that, that if you uh, refurbish equipment rather than recycle, if you modernize switch gear rather than just replace them, all of this contributes to limiting your carbon film footprint. And at the end of the day, or at the end of their life, make sure that you do not throw away your old transformer into the garbage, but these things can be collected and recycled, and you can make sure that you do not spill the used uh, oil and uh, the used material into the environment. One other example of a solution is are what we call predictive emissions management systems. Together with our daughter company, Aveva, we have such uh, systems 
that can monitor flue gas emissions and that can be a cost effective uh, alternative to hardware based emission monitoring systems. So a number of software can help you optimize the emission the emissions management and the emissions monitoring. And we have installed that at several operating facilities in the Middle East. Then remember that in a number of your processes, you may have exothermic processes. You have exothermic processes on one side and endothermic processes on the other side. And of course, you want to recover the excess heat on one side and preheat uh, the, the fluids, the, the gases, the stuff, the entrance on the other side. That means you need a number of heat exchangers. And of course, you want to optimize the design, the number, the size of these heat exchangers. We have such tools uh, in the Aveva range, they are called Romeo, it's part of the Romeo process optimization tool. Uh, we have such tools that can help you optimize the mass and heat balance into your, uh, into your plant, that can help you optimize the pinch methodology, and that can help you save a lot of money, of course, and can help you optimize your carbon and greenhouse gas footprint at the end of the day. We, we still have other software like advanced process control, production accounting, unified supply chain uh, platform. All of these can contribute to your optimization uh, in terms of uh, money, of course, but also in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Last but not, but not least, I mentioned your various retail, your various petrol stations, your various uh, office buildings, you may want to, uh, to check if these office buildings, if these petrol stations are really optimized in terms of air uh, heat, of, in terms of HVAC, air conditioning, uh, electrical distribution, etc. Very often you can achieve lots of savings less with just simple lighting controls, with just simple HVAC controls. And these are not rocket science solutions. These are solutions that are deployed in millions of buildings across the world. So it's maybe a small uh, hanging fruit, but it's a low hanging fruit that you can address very easily. So I've presented 13 approaches to optimize your greenhouse gas emissions. It's probably not exhaustive. But we have some examples and references uh, of using these. And let me just quickly go through an example of a US uh, gas treatment plant where they had 17 million of annual energy plant, uh, energy spent on their three processing uh, trains. They had uh, self-generation electricity. And uh, with a consulting approach with them where we spent some time on site assessing the different energy consumption patterns, identifying the different energy conservation measures. We have de deployed a number of, uh, of uh, measures and the cost was about $1 million for them. And the savings were $700,000 per year. So in practice, they had a payback of one and a half year and uh, it's already a couple of years back. So. Uh, their payback was a uh, huge compared to their payback was, uh, huge compared to the initial investment of one million dollars. So very often you have very short paybacks in terms of energy savings, energy saving costs, plus of course savings, energy saving costs, plus of course the carbon impact uh, uh, to the uh, to the uh, environment. So if I come back to the beginning, uh, one of my main slides, main slide, you, you may have different approaches, different solutions, uh, different measurement tools, but you really need to define what you want to do to set the targets, to deploy the programs, and be sure that you can measure the results. You can apply various solutions. You can uh, use a toolkits. Uh, as Schneider, we can probably provide you some of these. 
uh, and we are at your disposal to, uh, for, uh, for that. But you will need to articulate various solutions depending on what you want to do, uh, depending on whether you want to optimize emissions in your current op operations, on whether you want to build a new offshore platform, a new refinery, on whether you want to address the low hanging fruits in your current buildings, in your current data centers, in your current petrol stations, or whether you want to develop new energies and sell renewable energies to your customer instead of selling them only gasoline or diesel or, um, or natural gas. That's it for me. Uh, and uh, I will welcome your questions or, uh, or your comments on the subject. Mr. Irnou, back to you. Okay, thank you so much, um, Monsieur Eric Kinnick, for very insightful sharing. Um, as we have seen and we have heard, uh, Mr. Eric have provided some insight of how we can begin a journey in realizing the vision of migrating towards a more clean and lean renewable energy. Uh, this is also part of our effort to uh, make sure that uh, we still remain and relevant towards creating a sustainable future in the industry for Earth and humanity as a whole. All right, now I would like to invite uh, to all participants uh, to post any questions that you have to Mr. Eric. Uh, based on the chat space here, um, no question. Um, you can also switch on your mic uh, if uh, typing is taking too long. You can switch on your mic and uh, raise your question to Mr. Eric. Anyone? Okay, maybe while waiting for question to come, um, I would like to share, uh, to invite you all to provide um, some feedbacks on today's webinar. Um, let me share. Perhaps if you can um, scan uh, this uh, QR code and provide some feedbacks, that will be appreciated. Okay, do we have any question? To Mr. Eric. Okay, I guess um, there's not much for the questions uh, asked. I think... Um, Again, I would like to invite everyone to uh, provide some feedbacks on today's webinar so that we can better improve our session in the future. All right, just scan this QR code in your mobile device and give your feedback on two questions. Okay, I guess um, there's no further questions. Uh, Mr. Eric, I guess um, that would be all for today's event. We appreciate your presence, waking up early to present to us all the way from across the group. Thank you so much, sir. The Don't worry, it was 9 a.m. my time. Usually, uh, I'm uh, awake much earlier than that. <laughs> it was Maybe really my pleasure. One question. Yeah, one you. question. Eric, about the, you did not touch about the solar energy as the future to minimize the carbon mm -hmm. footprint. Eh? So what is your thoughts about that? 
Uh, I, di I did not touch it, but it is definitely uh, a major source of, uh, of uh, energy, like wind. I, I developed a little bit the wind energy. And uh, of yeah. course, solar energy is also a, a, a great source of, ener a, a great mm -hmm. source of energy. Uh, and we all know the, the issue with solar energy. It does not provide any uh, electricity at night. Uh, sometimes uh, you have uh, many clouds during the daytime, but you never have a lot of uh, sun during the night. So you you really need to be able to adapt your process uh, uh, for this intermittent uh, character of a, of a sun of a solar energy, or to make sure that you have uh, large batteries or that you uh, uh, use less energy during night because uh, you will have less from uh, the solar energy. Hydropower uh, uh, can be also a great uh, tool to ensure carbon neutral uh, energy. Uh, nuclear power is another one because the new may be challenging from some other aspects, but it produces no carbon emissions. But then nuclear energy has other issues and uh, usually is permitting and the uh, and the um, and the development of such a plant is uh, is very complex compared to a solar plant or a wind turbine. Okay, thank you so much uh, for the question and also for a clear answer from Mr. Eric. Any further questions from all participants? Okay, I guess uh, there's no further questions. With that, I would like to, on behalf of IEEE PES Malaysia chapter, we would like to thank uh, Mr. Eric for uh, very good presentations that's been shared today. And to the rest of you, thank you so much for attending the webinar. Before you leave, please make sure you again, please scan this QR code and provide some feedback for our future improvement. Mr. Eric uh, and all audience, thank you so much. And we look forward to see you again in the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.